Who wrote the Bible? Where does it come from? What does it mean? Is there a group of people historically who are responsible for the Bible and have shaped our faith? What did they teach and what can we celebrate as one human family about their teachings? This is Stan Matthews, and I'm here to tell you the story of the secret origin, coming to you directly from the land of origins, greater Ethiopia, the oldest nation in the world. About 150,000 years ago, the rains coming from the Ethiopian highlands began forming the foundation of what is known today as the Nile River. About 7,000 years ago, the Nile River Basin finally established its finishing point at the Mediterranean seas. All throughout this period of over 100,000 years, people from the Ethiopian highlands and all of East Africa settled along this highway, this massive river that would bring life, bring culture, bring faith for the people. And the people brought with them their culture, they brought with them their science, their economics, their laws, their morals, and their ethics. Most importantly, they brought their sacred science, they brought their faith. And so these people established the greatest, most storied civilization known to man. That civilization is the Kemetic civilization, what we now call the Egyptian high classic civilization. What are we here for? We're here to hear the voice of a scholar, Dr. Ahmed Osman reveal what we call the secret origin, the origin of the patriarchs of the Bible, the origin of David, the person who established and reinforced the first global empire. We're here to hear the story of the dreamer, Joseph, the man who told his brothers, one day I would rule, the inheritor of an inheritance directly from Isaac. We're here to find out the secret origin of the man known as Solomon, the man of peace, the man of wisdom, the man of wealth and riches. We're here to find out the origin of a famous relationship he had with the queen of the south that we call Sheba today, but was from the land of Punt, which is present day Somaliland or Eritrea. That whole northern coast of the Horn of Africa. We're here today to learn the secret origin of the lawgiver, Moses, the person who I believe to be the most revolutionary thinker on the concept of the one God, the universal God that ever walked the earth. We're here to learn the secret origin of the man called Joshua, his son, the son of Nun who some believe may have been the example of the messianic leader that would have its full flowering in the first century in a revolutionary leader we now know as Christ. But the role model for the one who would call the people to salvation, stand as a messianic ruler was Joshua. Dr. Roseman's work, The Secret Origin, is a must have for your library. It's a must have for everyone's library because it demonstrates that these were historical real figures 
and they had an impact on our social lives, our political lives, our economic lives, and our spiritual lives, even today. Get your copy of Secret Origin, but first enjoy what we have prepared for you. Thanks for coming and enjoy Secret Origin. Good afternoon, this is Stan Matthews, and I welcome all of you to this very special uh, opportunity to hear the words of a master of, en of enlightenment as he unveils for us his thought process over a 50 plus year period to uncover, unravel, and reveal truths about our Bible and about our past that we may not have thought about or may not have dared to understand. I'm with Egyptologist and scholar, Dr. Ahmed Osman, who has groundbreaking work that he wants to share with the world and that he has shared over five centuries. And so we start today by asking him, why was it, why was it Dr. Osman, that you thought that we should look at Egypt again and find as we look at Egypt, the biblical characters coming to life in the personages of Tutmosis III, who you regard to be the David of the Bible, Amenhotep III, who you regard to be Solomon of the Bible, Akhenaten, who you regard to be Moses of the Bible, and Tutankhamun, who you regard to be Joshua, or in some cases, maybe even Jesus. So let's start there. Why this body of work? Why look at Egypt again? You see, the thing, I was born in 1934. By 1947, when the United Nations decided to make uh, two states in, uh, in an Israeli state and an Arab state in Palestine, I was 13 years old. My father died when I was young, 
So I had, I was, a, I mean, looking for kind of a spiritual support. So I became a religious, uh, Islamic religious uh, uh, person. And at the time, my teacher at school for religious uh, was was Hassan al Banda, the uh, the guy who established the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, asking, uh, hoping to return the Islamic State again in uh, Egypt. You see. I, I mean, uh, when they wanted to stop the establishing of the State of Israel in Palestine, and they said, I mean, if you were to go and fight against the, the Jews, in, I mean, you have to one of two options. Either you die, you die as a martyr and go to heaven, or you are being you, you kill the, the enemies of God. I mean, I mean, this uh, Hassan al Banna was assassinated a year later, and I was free from uh, the school, and I started to think on my own. I wanted to know if uh, I mean, I mean, if. Uh, uh, I mean, what is really the roots between it and, and Israel? What is the origin? Because the, the, the Quran, whom I, I was brought to read, uh, says that, uh, I mean, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, the same as the Bible. So the, they were in Egypt. I mean, why are we enemies, enemies now? What, what's the root? So I wanted to know, I read the Bible, I read the Quran, but I wanted to know from history, now with archaeology and so on, all every single part of Egyptian history has been revealed. So if the stories in the Bible and the Quran were historical, then it should be, we should find evidence of it in, in, the, history, in the history side, in the archaeology evidence. So I started to stop and, and go and read, I mean, uh, 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 the history of ancient Egypt. I went to London. I studied uh, Egyptian history. I studied uh, uh, Egyptian language. I studied the Bible, and I wanted to find the evidence. Now, the the cornerstone of the story is the exodus of the Israelites under Moses from Egypt. Eventually, uh, I, I came to to realize that there is an evidence of that because you see. I regard that Moses and Akhenaten of ancient Egypt. Akhenaten is the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, who was first in the history, known from the history side, not from the Bible, that he recognized the unity of God and called it Aten, which means that light or, or uh, I mean, energy of light. He called it Aten, one, one God for the first time. And then again, when we look at the story of the Bible, we find that after the Exodus, sometime after the, about two centuries after the Exodus, we find that the, the King David, a uh, King David, uh, the, uh, the Israelite, I mean, according uh, to the Bible, established a, an empire between the Nile and the Euphrates. When we look at the evidence of archaeology, including the uh, Israeli archaeology, they found no evidence. Uh, that uh, I mean, the empire, is, the empire was established by David during the time of the 10th century BC. No evidence whatsoever. I mean, Israeli archaeologists and self accepted that. We, we, and then at the same time, all uh, I mean, everything mentioned in the Bible about David establishing an empire, we found. I mean, they found evidence of it. However, five centuries earlier than the time of David, at the time of the Moses III. So this was the first time I linked the Moses III because the evidence of the biblical account of the David empire was found at the time of the Moses III. Historically, he established the empire. So I, I started to, 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 to think that way, yes. This was the big, I, I wanted to know, I mean, I don't want to just to have different um, mythological idea. I want to know the truth about, about, I mean, the whole idea, nowadays, I'm sorry to say that Egyptian, uh, I mean, archaeologists like Zahi Hawass and so on, 
they think that if they were to accept that there is some evidence in Egypt regarding the Israelites in Egypt, uh, this will confirm the right of the Jews to establish a Jewish state. And this is why they, I mean, Hawass says there is no evidence whatsoever at all from archaeology that the Israelites were in Egypt. This is very strange because Moses and Akhenaten was one and the same person. I mean, this is the whole idea. I, I don't look, I mean, I started as a fanatic Muslim, but now I see things differently because I rely on facts of history and archaeology, not in the mythology. Sounds like science to me. Now, as we uh, begin this uh, revelation work, um, there are those who um, believe that you are taking a position on one of the three great faiths. Uh, I don't see that. I think you are simply revealing facts as you see them to be and not making any commentary on any of the three great faiths. Is that correct? Not at all. I'm not uh, against, I mean, I'm not denying either the Bible or the Quran. I'm not denying, I'm just reinterpreting uh, uh, according to modern. You see, in the Bible, in the holy books in, in generally, you have two, two sources. One thing about faith, and this you cannot change if you believe in God, one God, if you believe in, I mean, in Jesus, whatever, the belief. And I cannot challenge that. But there are things that in the Bible and the Quran talks about events, historical events that took place. And this has to be we change according to our historical knowledge. You see, it's, it's, the faith will not, I'm not denying faith, I'm confirming it by introducing the evidence to show it. Although the evidence make it look a little bit different. Well, I think it, I think it also confirms, it confirms to people uh, what they have believed. So, uh, as we begin, um, get comfortable, relax, get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, and enjoy a look at Egypt, reinterpreted through the eyes of Dr. Ahmed Osman. In our memories, in our stories, and in our history, as many ways as there are to say it, they have always been among us, the keepers of our legacy. What if you discovered that the same people who are living in the projects are the very same people that built the pyramids? Infringement, appropriation, and the superimposition of foreign cultural images have conspired throughout history to deny the inheritance of our African ancestry. The reconciliation of truth, belief, and verifiable historical facts can lead to a greater revelation and understanding in today's world, where information can be researched by anyone with access to the internet. We are in the age of knowing. In the search for truth, we acknowledge a willingness to challenge our beliefs and utilize archaeological evidence from trusted, peer-reviewed, and reliable sources to confirm what becomes a new knowledge and understanding of the past. Breaking free from mythology and dogma to chart a new future. This is the seed of enlightenment. Seeds are the origin of every living thing, including human civilization. Together we will explore the first global empire and the seeds it has sown for the religious, governmental, economic, military, education, and social power dynamics 
in the world today. Groundbreaking, controversial, and radical in its departure from traditional historic narratives of pre-modern Egypt, the work of historian and scholar Ahmed Osma re-examines and compares archaeological timelines with biblical texts to draw the stunning and irrefutable conclusion. Fascinating in its scope and transformational in the implications of his perspective, Amen Osman reveals the identity of fundamental icons of the Old Testament. And funny enough, they are not quite who we thought they were. About 3,660 years ago, Egypt faced an invasion by Bedouin tribes coming from the Sinai. These invaders were known as the Hyksos. They were eventually able to control Lower Egypt. After 100 years, Tekinen Re Tau, who ruled over Thebes in Upper Egypt, launched a war to liberate the country from Hyksos rule. When Sekinen Re was killed in the war, his son, Amose, was able to defeat the Hyksos and establish the 18th dynasty that ruled Egypt. Ahmed Osmar believes this to be the origin of the messianic royal bloodline for the similarity between the Tao dynasty and the kings of the Bible. Amose's son, Amenhotep I, who succeeded him, chased the Hyksos rulers out of Egypt into Canaan. He was succeeded by Tutmose I, Sekenenre's grandson, who marched north across the Levant and conquered all the land between Egypt and the Euphrates River in northern Syria. Following the death of Thutmose I, he was succeeded by Thutmose II, who being the son of a concubine, had to marry Hatshepsut, Thutmose I's daughter, to gain a right to the throne. However, when Thutmose II desired to appoint his young son, Thutmose III as his successor, Hatshepsut his wife, refused to let him marry her daughter to the heiress, Neferude. For the custom in ancient Egypt provided that whoever married the heiress, the eldest daughter of the last pharaoh, had the right to succeed him on the throne. For this reason, princes had to marry their sisters. That was the reason that allowed the descendants of Sekinenre Tau through the female line to rule Egypt almost until the end of the 18th dynasty. Unable to appoint his son to be his successor, Thutmose II decided to appeal to the god Amun to adopt Thutmose III as his son in order to give him the right to succeed him without marrying his half-sister, the heiress. To do this, Thutmose II brought his young son to the temple of Karnak, where the high priest supervised the ritual of six priests chanting, Come, come in peace, receive the light, shine like Ra in the double horizon. The eye of Horus destroys the enemies of Amun-Ra, Lord of Kana. Hail to you, censor of the gods. Our king prays to you to choose his son to be your son. The priest exited the Holy of Holies, carrying an image of Amun in an ark, in a procession around the Karnak Hall. When they came to the place where young Thutmose III was standing, they halt, unable 
to move. The young prince prostrates himself in front of the ark. Then the high priest announces, Our Lord, our moon, has chosen Prince Thutmose to be his son. Following this announcement, Prince Thutmose is seen shining in a dark heaven where the god Ra places the serpent diadems of royalty upon his forehead and presents him to other Egyptian gods, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Set, Ptah, Hathor, and Anubis. When Tadmose II died, he was succeeded by young Tadmose III and his stepmother Hatshepsut as his co-regent. As Tadmose III was still a young boy, Hatshepsut ruled the country alone until her death. Rebellions in the Levant royal as once subservient kings threatened to attack Egypt refusing to acknowledge the authority of the young pharaoh. Unwilling to negotiate, Thutmose III, at the head of his army, went first by boats to the border military city of Zawar in northern Sinai. The next morning, priests carrying the Ark of Amun led the way as they marched the military road to Canaan. Followed by Thutmose III, his army generals, and infantry. When they arrived at the city of Gaza, they rested for the night and celebrated the god Amun-Ra. The following morning, they marched north by the sea towards central Canaan. When Tutmose and his army arrived at the small town of Yehem, south of a mountain ridge near Har Megiddo, they decided to camp there. They had to decide how to proceed in their attack of the fortified city of Megiddo that lay on the other side of the mountain. Either go around the mountain and face their enemies in front of Megiddo, or use a shorter and narrower route over the mountain itself. While his officers preferred to go around the mountain to avoid the narrow road over the mountain, Tadmose preferred to use the road over the mountain so that he could surprise his enemy coming out behind their troops. Tadmose marched at the head of the army over the mountain, dismantling their chariots and marching single file with each man leading their horse. When they emerged on the other side of the mountain, they waited for the rest of the army to arrive. No enemy forces detected their arrival. Suddenly, Thutmose and his troops ran down the mountain behind the enemy forces, expecting them on the other road, and attacked them. Thutmose, in a chariot of fine gold, chasing his enemy. The Egyptian forces prevailed in the ensuing battle, and the kings opposed to Thutmose fled to the sanctuary of fortified Megiddo, where the gates of the city had been shut. The fleeing kings were hauled to safety by citizens who let down garments to hoist them up. His enemies had abandoned their horses and their chariots of gold and silver. Tutmose III leaves his army sieging the city of Megiddo and goes to stay at Jerusalem with his personal guards carrying the ark of his god Amun. During his six months in Jerusalem, which was known as Kadesh at the time, Tutmose III places the ark of his god Amun on the holy rock which he used to worship each morning. Then he traveled back to Megiddo to receive the city when its gates were opened. Following the Battle of Megiddo, Thutmose III went home to Egypt, then returned to the Levant 
to regain the borders of his grandfather, but mostly the first empire by the Euphrates River, and established his name on a stele next to that of his grandfather. Thus, the mighty pharaoh won 17 military campaigns, which we recorded on the walls of the Temple of Amun at Karnak. In the Kemetic language, the first part of his name, Tut, is equivalent to the Hebrew Dud, or the root of King David's name in the Bible. Megiddo, which was conquered by Tutmosi III, is also mentioned in the Bible as one of the cities inherited by King Solomon from his father, David. At the same time, although Megiddo is not mentioned by that name in the New Testament, the term Armageddon or Har Megiddo, meaning Mountain of Megiddo, is mentioned in Revelation as a place of judgment against the enemies of God. While the name Armageddon has become popular and synonymous with the end of days involving a great military conflict between good and evil. The Bible also gives us another important story of Tutmose III, Pharaoh of Egypt, for it was during the time of his rule in the 15th century BC that we first hear of the Hebrews in the land of Canaan. During the reign of Tutmose III, after he was named General of Egypt's armies by Hatshepsut, becoming Pharaoh upon her death, he granted an audience with a traveling Babylonian prince named Abraham. Misled to believe that Sarah, Abraham's wife, was his sister, he took her as one of his wives. The Pharaoh was distraught when it was revealed that he had taken another man's wife. According to the Book of the Dead, originally called the coming forth by day unto night, such an action could deny him a chance at immortality in the afterlife. He essentially bought off Abraham with gold, servants, and resources, including a wet nurse, Hagar, to care for a pregnant Sarah. Where history and biblical metaphors and mythologies merge is that archaeologists can only find and corroborate the victories of Tutmose III at Harmagedo, and there is no trace of any battles at all attributable to David. Tutmose had slept with another man's wife, and she bore his child. Similarly, David slept with Bathsheba, also another man's wife, and she bore his child. After Saul died, newly crowned David, it is said, went to war to recover territories to the east. What previous Latin claims did David have anywhere? Most importantly, history reveals that it was Tadnose III that brought the ark of his god Amun to Kadesh, built a mountaintop shrine to worship his god in a place that came to be known as the City of God, or Zion. So, Dr. Osman, as we close uh, this part of the Secret Origin series, uh, please share with your audience, with our audience, why you think making David a real historical figure, while why making Joseph the dreamer a real historical figure, why making Solomon 
the wise man, uh, a real historical figure, Moses, the lawgiver, a real historical figure, and Joshua or the Jesus model, a more historical, understandable figure. How would that promote greater fellowship and understanding uh, in this world uh, of war, misunderstanding, um, and in many cases, falsehood? How would this uh, work, Secret Origin, foster greater brotherhood, greater alignment, greater fellowship and understanding? In reality, Stan, I'm not making these characters uh, historical because if we believe in the stories of the Bible, uh, 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 I mean, David made a big empire between the giving a, a geographical location and time in history and so on. Jesus appeared as historical as Moses and so on. So all what I'm trying to do, I'm not inventing, I'm not producing something new. I'm just trying to see what is behind the story, what is the real historical events that were told by the Bible in the stories. You see, uh, I believe that our uh, be, uh, religious beliefs, like our being really, have made through, I mean, gone through a, a, an evolution. I mean, from a period to another period, from an era to another era. And that's why now I believe that our faith, our religion, is going to a new era. And we have to understand it according to this era. For instance, I'm not making it on my own. This is a must. So we have heard a few days ago that uh, Pope Francis of Rome, I mean, uh, Rome, you know, about five centuries ago, uh, this, I mean, uh, condemned Galileo uh, for death because he said that the earth goes around, that the earth is circle, not flat, and it goes around the sun. He was killed because of that. At the time, it was regarded as uh, a heresy, as something uh, against the... However, uh, the Pope Francis, two or three days ago, said that he believed in the Darwin uh, evolution uh, ideas. And not only that, but he believed also in the Big Bang. I mean, uh, he said the creation, as it is in the Bible, story, I mean, is not historical. We cannot take it as historical. But, I mean, this we have to understand it in a different way. So all what I am doing, you see, I mean, in the beginning, when man was a primitive creature, I mean, each tribe had its own religion, its own God, you see. And its God, they believed that this God will help the tribe fighting the, another tribe to get, uh, to get the water or, or the food or whatever it is. Then, the, uh, with time, we went through a village structure, a city structure, and a state structure. And each time, God has become, uh, I mean, different. I mean, until, I mean, then when we have an empire, Egyptian empire, the Roman Empire, the Islamic Empire, God become universal. However, it became universal within the limits of the empire. Yeah, the China is not part of it, so it has another God. Uh, I mean, uh, South yeah. Africa and so on. But now we have come to realize through our, uh, uh, I mean, uh, scientific uh, uh, understanding that the whole uh, planet we are living in is one unit. And whatever happens in, I mean, environment or, or weather or whatever it is, does affect all of us. We can die all of us or live all of us. We have to, we are one. So it, it, now is the time to see that God is a universal God. 
you can be a Christian, you can be a, a Muslim, you can be a Jew, you can be a, a, I mean, a, a, a Hindu or, or whatever it is. But if God has created the world, then this God is one for all of us. Although we come and, then, and see it from different views, if we have different ideas of God, but it has to be one for all of us. In this case, why should we fight? Why should we, I mean, before our, my God, I mean, will help me to, feel, to defeat your God. I, now, if our God is a universal God, is for all of us, we shouldn't fight. We shouldn't hate each other. We should keep the planet, all the planet. Not only, I do not only to try to protect my land and, and my country, but also your land and his land and her land. We, we are now, I mean, as the Pope said, we are all descendants of, of the Darwin evolution. Uh, and, and we all came, I mean, as a result, the whole creation came as a result of the Big Bang. We have a one source of our existence and we have a one planet to live in all of us. Why should we fight? Why should the Russians fight? And, 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 I mean, the, the world is in Europe for no reason. Why should the Chinese and the Americans have a conflict? Why should the Israelis and the Arabs have a conflict? Why should we do that? Why don't we sit down, all of us, and realize that we are belonging to the same planet and we have to work together to protect us? You see, in, in, in a few hundred years, or maybe a thousand years, we are working to destroy our planet. We are working to destroy the Earth we live in. If we go on like we are doing now, our planet is in danger of uh, completely destruction. So we have the chance now because of our... I mean, look at NASA and, and the, the photograph they have for the universe. I mean, this is... This is a jump, a complete jump in, in, in the future. We, we can see our minor uh, place within this uh, universe. So we have to keep our universe, we have to keep our planet. Otherwise, we would all be destroyed. So I think now is the time to re-understand the mythology. I mean, the Greeks and the Romans had the Olymp, and, and, the, and, the, and the gods fighting and whatever it is. This was at the time uh, the understanding. Now, when uh, with the Torah and the Quran and, and the Bible and so on, we started to believe that God created Adam and Eve about 600 years. Now we cannot do that. Now we have to rely on our modern uh, and, uh, scientific understanding, knowledge, to, to, to re-understand the, the core of the, of the religion is there. The only thing is how we understand it. We have to re-understand. So if they say Moses did so and so and so, Jesus, was Moses a real historical character or was, was it a, a mythology like the, the gods of the Olim? If he was a historical, if these characters, biblical characters, were real characters of history, then we should find evidence of them and details of their stories in history. And that's exactly what I've been doing. So uh, bringing people together and get going into a new era. We are, whether I do it or not, um, maybe I'm just a voice crying in the, in, in the I mean, but at the end of the day, when the Pope Francis of Rome says that this is a great step to the future. I'm just telling you what is happening now according to our modern scientific understanding. Well, we thank you for uh, more than 50 years of work in this area of trying to um, uh, further the cause of fellowship, brotherhood, and peace uh, by making uh, historical events more real to give us a greater understanding 
of some of the events that we've been told about in sacred science and the holy books. You know, the Indian Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Islamic Quran, the Christian Bible, the Jewish Torah. These are filled with stories. And if you can help us to make these stories more real um, and look at the historical events in them and see if we can make the events more real and the characters more real, it doesn't change the stories. It just makes, it just gives us a deeper insight into them. And so we thank you for this work. Uh, I encourage all of those who will see this video to get a copy of Secret Origin now. Um, we are uh, working uh, with several uh, platforms to produce a series and a featured film uh, to foster again, greater brotherhood, greater understanding, and greater peace. If you like today's content, then make the connection and subscribe to Matthews TV on our YouTube channel so you can continue to get great news about all that's going on in the Secret Origin community and also around the globe in the global black community, the global brown community. This is Stan Matthews. I'll see you soon. Subscribe now.